Um, because of our time, we're going to make a rapid transition to the policy roundtable, at which we're now going to move and talk about how we're going to apply this evidence in the healthcare system in a variety of different ways. So the patients and the clinical expert, you should stay exactly where you are. Um, but I'll ask the <clears throat> scientific team to um, go ahead and sit back down and invite the other policy roundtable members. That's Dr. Gleason and Dr. Martin. That's fine. That's fine. As long as it doesn't kill people. Well, that's what we're gonna test. Okay, test for it. That's fine. Really yeah, I just we're gonna lighten it up a bit. If she, he, Not my demeanor, but the room. I hope. Younger age. See how, how that does. How much difference that would make? Okay, thanks. All right. In terms of education, you know, the, all the opportunities. All right. All that's yeah. That's that's good. Okay, that's good. <clears throat> all right. We're gonna do this in an hour. So um, sometimes we wonder if, if, a, if a whole day isn't too long for one topic. Today was not one of those days. It's felt like we could have kept going in, in many different ways. But now we have a chance to really kind of, um, in some ways, keep drilling in, but also step back and ask a lot more about <clears throat> some of the broader aspects of how this treatment will be brought into clinical practice, how it will be covered, how it will be paid for, and again, I like to circle back to the goal of the overall value framework, which is how do we get sustainable access to, to high value mm -hmm. care? How do, we, how do we maximize the ability of patients to get this at a price that aligns with value, but in the bigger picture, we're now, you know, we're faced with this situation and we want to try to figure out what's the best way forward. So, actually I still want to definitely go back and start with some of the patient's input and maybe the clinical expert's input. So we're going to have Luxterna available. It's available. Um, what else do patients need? You made, Janet, you made a very powerful statement that, especially in some um, communities, there's going to have to be real outreach and education to the clinicians in those communities, to the patients and families, to make sure that they get equal access to this medication, um, to this treatment. Um, when you think about the, the structural supports that the patient community or the blind community would need to make sure that, you know, they maximize the access to, and understanding about this treatment, what could we say kind of that policymakers need to get together, whether it's the payers, the manufacturer, or other policymakers, what, what do they need to focus on to make sure that the patients and the different communities get equal access and good access to this drug? Janet? I think that that education piece, I think making sure that uh, the decision making as policymakers uh, is, is happening, that it incorporates the various communities of practice that are going to be uh, critical partners in this process. So it always starts at the nucleus with the family, uh, uh, you know, obviously that, that will be impacted um, by the that will be impacted by the decision making. But also I think that it's equally important to, to um, make sure that across the medical community, and that's not just the eye care providers, but it's the medical community. Also, it's the people in that uh, outside of that nucleus that may have contact with the individual families. It's also the rehabilitation field as well. It's the veterans administrations. It's the people who may be uh, coming in contact with these individuals that could be potential uh, benefactors of this therapy so that there is a consideration in place to understand who are the partners you know throughout this network and what contributions can can be made whether those are in-kind contributions or whether or not they are policy contributions or resource contributions that are going to contribute to the decision making as well as the application of the services and supports as well. Equally important, I think, is reaching out in a way, not just to the community, but in a way that that respective community can hear the information and understand the information and has an investment in <clears throat> understanding. So in culturally diverse communities, it may not start at the at that nucleus. It may start with, the, it'll start with the family, obviously, but it may also include the faith-based community who 
play a, an important role in culturally diverse communities in our country. So it, it, it really is understanding who are the individuals that need to be taken into consideration. It's also making policy decisions that, that are, are, are made in a way that are not continuous barriers for the families and the individuals being impacted by the decision making um, process and that there are, it's critical to have uh, exceptions or uh, for certainly to consider uh, who are the partners that are going to be ensuring that, first of all, that the individual will be benefiting and that the progress can be measured and, and that certainly that the individual is, is going to be uh, benefiting in the long term from this type of a, a therapy and intervention. And so I think that having a network and, and starting at the nucleus and working your way out and then delivering that information in a way that is, is appropriate for each respective community. All right, thank you very much. Caitlin, I'm not sure if you've thought this much, uh, that much about this, but should there be like a public kind of set of kind of advertisements that should go out to alert families that might have children with visual problems to get them screened? Is there, I'll ask the clinical expert too about some of these efforts, but have you had any thoughts about what, what efforts could go into supporting the broader patient community around the introduction of this treatment? I have had some thoughts in the sense of who do we as visually impaired growing up interact with the most and who would it then be important to disseminate this information because it is it is a small population it there is a lot that one could put into educating your primary care or your ophthalmologist to recognize if you have a inherited retinal disease that you should be tested and that there are these treatments, let alone other clinical trials out there. To have that information at those types of clinicians' fingertips would be a huge improvement in comparison to how I grew up where it, it is like how Janet said, you, you go to each doctor explaining what your issue is because they don't know because it's not well known. And there are doctors who are, are specialists, there are low vision, um, clinics that you can go to that even from my experience in California, I had the Department of Rehabilitation that would send me to low vision clinics. Um, but at that point, you, you are an adult and it, therefore you're either 16 or older that you are hooked up in that system. So it does need to be more mm -hmm. with pediatricians, with ophthalmologists when you're first getting checked out. I mean, I, my parents got me diagnosed when I was nine months old with LCA. and there wasn't the gene therapy or genetic testing really for these types of diseases at that time, but if there was, I could have, they could have known at nine months. So that's definitely at least, huh. I think All right. that's, that's, that's very helpful. So, so Dr. K, turning to you too. So this is not just retinal specialists who need to now know about this condition and this treatment, right? I mean, it needs to, pay, I mean, how, do you envision something ideally where um, you know, pediatricians, uh, this is woven into their training where every single ophthalmology resident needs to show competence and knowing about how to diagnose and refer appropriately. How do we up the game of the entire clinical infrastructure to do the right things? I, I mean, I think it definitely starts with education. Medical school training would be a good place to start to kind of hit the doctor community. But then optom for this particular disease, optometry is extremely important optometry. because they are it's, non, it's not a medical degree, but optometry degree are often the people who are seeing these patients at first. And um, I actually have a lot of direct referrals from, from optometry to retina, and I take those direct referrals um, rather than go through an ophthalmologist. So I think we really need to target the optometry community too, and there may be a big knowledge gap there otherwise if we don't, because that's just a different field that might not be as well versed in gene therapy and these updates and novel treatments. So that's what I do in my community is I give talks to the optometric society in my area and you know I've been doing that for years and years prior to Lex Turney even being on the scenes just to talk about genetic testing but I think if we all start doing that as physicians across the country then we'll, we can disseminate this information. Um, but what might happen so op optometrists see kids with all kinds of visual issues at a relatively young age. Are they going to be able to know which ones need to be referred on to a retinal specialist? Should they be sending them for the gene test before it gets, I mean, 
I could imagine an avalanche of kids with visual problems in their early school years. Uh, is there a risk there of kind of overwhelming the system, or do we have to figure out different ways to triage patients? What well, I mean, I didn't want to overemphasize the misdiagnosis thing. I think it's important that, that there is a misdiagnosis rate and that some people aren't diagnosed until they're six or eight. But, you know, classically, LCA, we should be seeing some nystagmus. We should be seeing poor fixation. We should have some difficulties infantile onset. Um, that an optometrist should absolutely be picking up on. And with optometry training, they should have some knowledge of that being abnormal and in, in the IRD you know, category, if they don't know the word RP65 or LCA, they, you know, they at least know, let's refer this person. So I don't think this is totally novel for them. I think they can pick up nystagmus and they can pick up parents saying that my, my child doesn't function at night. Um, so I mean, I don't think it's gonna be novel, but uh, I, I think just increasing the, the information of how, what to do next. You know, when you have someone that you have a, you expect something in, where do you refer? Identifying centers where um, they're not gonna bounce around to 10 different places where you say, okay, I think there might be something going on in the LCA category, I'm not sure, but who's the person in the Southeast that looks at you know, LCA, given the, the approval of Luxturna? So getting referral patterns set up um, might be helpful. Um, so you don't diagnosis. envision there being a very large pool of patients who are suddenly going to be at least considered for referral through to a, to a retina specialist now that there's a treatment. You think it, the, the signs are, are rare enough that we're, st we're not going to get a lot of false positives, if you will? I, I don't know. It'll be interesting. I, I mean, I, it, it, I, it's hard to know. <laughs> I think well, we always have false positives, and I have people emailing me from all over the thing, you know, world saying, Lux turn, I have something wrong with my eyes, can I have that? And I'm saying, well, actually, no, it's not for that disease. You know, so there's a lot of misinformation out there. And um, yes, you will definitely have more in patients <coughs> contacting doctors saying, I, I've heard of gene therapy, can that fix me? I have diabetic retinopathy. Can I, does that work for diabetic retinopathy? You know, so I think there'll be a lot of misinformation and that can be frustrating, but it doesn't mean, that might be the first, you know, consult for that patient, but I don't think that's gonna, increase the health care costs significantly right. is what I'm saying. So if you go online right now, let's say you're a parent, and you Google uh, veretagene specialist, will you find anything? Probably not, right? Probably not, no. If you, so how do you know, do we need a system in which even what people Google would help them identify, as you said, somebody identified in their state or their region who's the go-to person? Is that something that the American Academy of Ophthalmology should start setting up or, or, or you know, because this is where a lot of things start. I guess you could say it's the optometrist, but they would also have to know to whom should I refer this person. I mean, there's a lot of word of mouth networks like that, um, but I don't know if there's one place online where that is listed, you know, so, but um, I think ASRS, American Society of Retina Specialists, would be a good source where you theoretically could use that website or the AAO website. Um, that those sites could be used and we could talk to some of the leaders in those two mm -hmm. organizations. Those are really big organizations yeah. for ophthalmologists and then try to create some links that now there was such an internet society that would help navigate other doctors to refer referral patterns. But right now I think it's just kind of word of mouth right. and people who know. It'll be, I think it'll be really interesting to see how the Kaisers of the world do this. You know, how will they spread the information within pediatrics? How will they set up certain of their retina specialists maybe to be the point uh, people for this? Um, I haven't spoken to anybody in a, in a large integrated system yet, but I'm sure there are going to be some discussions around how, how to organize this internal and, system. And I would add that I would hope that, that as, you know, there's conversations about this or, you know, potential strategies for looking at this, that it, it is, that it includes, you know, optometrists as well, because many right. individuals who have low vision or are diagnosed with blindness often do see an optometrist first. Um, also, you know, it's important uh, to note that many of the states, uh, there are 24 blindness-specific agencies across the country. And some of those agencies, not all, have mandatory reporting of legal blindness in their respective states. And I think that that also makes a difference as well. I wish every state had a mandatory registration of blindness. Um, and it, regardless of what, that, what the condition is, it's important to get that information so early on so that the proper channeling of the uh, services and supports and medical treatment that needs to happen for those families often can happen and so that people like myself and and Kate are not 
you know, going through channels, and, and we're not uncommon. I mean, I can't tell you how many individuals who are blind and visually impaired that I've worked with over the years, and we go through this sort of maze of medical people, including op ophthalmology, who, who don't understand what we have, or, and then you just go through this maze of really becoming, you know, a guinea pig until yeah. somebody finally <laughs> figures it out, and, you know, I haven't seen this condition. I'd like you to see 10 other doctors here. We want to see what it looks like. You know, so I wish there were, you know, were a mandatory process, a registration process, and I'll tell you legislatively, that's probably where both the ophthalmology as well as the optometry community can be helpful. Uh, as well, so not just looking at this as a medical, but also as a legislative, you know, uh, potential issue as well. So I would assume that at least a f some number, fair number, perhaps of the older patients who might benefit from treatment, maybe on Medicaid, maybe on disability, is the Medicaid system set up to be able to have the retina specialists who will accept Medicaid patients to do the same kind of screening and and ultimately treatment for patients with private insurance. We don't have someone from Medicaid here today, but um, and I'll, I'll get to the payers soon. I haven't even introduced you guys yet, so <laughs> we'll do that soon. Um, do any of you know, in particular, any of the thinking around how the Medicaid system will start to deal with some of these issues? Medicaid currently pays for ophthalmology visits for individuals who are blind and visually impaired as well. Is, and, and so they do pay for, um, and, and depending on, now there might be some variations in terms of the, the extent of the actual coverage from state to state, um, but they do cover because it's considered a medical condition. So they do, and they will cover, you know, the treatment, not necessarily this particular, uh, the, the treatment of a condition. I'm not talking about the, the, the actual genetic testing uh, part of it uh, as of yet. But, uh, but I think that that is an important discussion to have because Medicaid also has, as part of its system, uh, the uh, networking and, and policy making around uh, helping individuals also mm -hmm. to uh, become rehabilitated and also return to work. So I would right. think that this would be an important conversation right. uh, with, uh, with CMS in D.C. Yeah, and we'll try to do some, some discussion offline around whether the rates that Medicaid pays for, this, for these kinds of services is adequate to have the right. network of clinicians seeing but, patients that would... I mean, they, they do have limited networks, and Medicaid actually will sometimes even assign which physician in a given community is the network physician. So sometimes physicians don't even have the choice to join a network. Same thing, AvMed, you know, all these private insurers, they sometimes will actually define um, which physicians in the area right. somewhat randomly, as you all know, um, will network with, with particular physicians and they'll actually put a cap on it, particularly for retina. So I, I, I absolutely have networks that I cannot see and can't bill. Now I do this as a, my career, so I actually, I, as a rule, my office knows if I have a patient coming with a referral of any inherited retinal disease, I see them for no charge. So I have a lot of, I don't make a lot of money when I see these patients because I literally see them all for no charge. But that's just me. I mean, I don't think most retinal doctors out there are doing that. Um, but that's because that's my niche and I like to see these patients and get them diagnosed and I have ways to get them genetic testing for free because of grants. Right. But I think it's a problem that we need to address. Okay. So let me include the, the, the payers who have joined the Policy Roundtable now and now I will take the opportunity to have you guys introduce yourselves. Um, but then I have, I'll start off with a question for you too. So Pat, we're gonna start with you. Just introduce yourself. Sure, I'm uh, Pat Gleason, I work for Prime Therapeutics, a uh, pharmacy benefit manager owned by a nonprofit Blue Cross Blue Shield plans across the United States. I'm a senior director of health outcomes, I'm a researcher and a pharmacist. Thanks, and Bill? Yeah, hi, I'm Bill Martin, I lead the uh, commercial efforts for uh, Credo, which is a division of Express Scripts. So I guess you'd say I'd see the, uh, uh, the pharmacy side of things, the payer side of things through the PBM, and uh, that gives us a, uh, for better or worse, a bird's eye view of this, uh, the chaos of our healthcare system, for better or worse. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for being with us today. Um, you may or may not actually be the right people to ask this question, but the, uh, the, the issue of testing, the genetic test that is part of the diagnosis, came up. Is that something that you would have some control over, the coverage for that test as part of the, the process here, or does that have to be held by the, the health plan and not by the PBM? So from a, uh, from a PBM standpoint, that where we would see that uh, 
come into play would be with the prior authorizations or treatment authorizations. So uh, many folks think of a PBM as managing only pharmacy benefit drugs, and you may think, well, okay, well, this is going to be uh, performed in a treatment center, so why would a PBM be involved? Uh, at least with Express Scripts, that is not the case. We are very involved uh, with also medical, uh, medical benefit, many drugs that are administered in the hospital and would be active in treatment authorizations also. So just to be clear, if a patient is at a doctor's office, the doctor says you need to get this genetic test, is it you guys don't have a role in whether so that's covered? Whether the test is covered or not, that's not will be job. up to the independent, right. uh, the individual payer, the plan sponsor. Whether a, a positive result is, is required in order that's to, up to receive treatment authorization, that's where we would be involved. Okay. Pat? Yeah, I would second that. That uh, comes under medical policy in the case of uh, Bruce Plant owners. That's their purview. I will say that we've spent a lot of time talking about this drug along with uh, the CAR-T cancer therapies that are considered gene therapies. Um, I'll just say that in particular for Luxterna, and we appreciate Sparks covering the tests currently, Spark, I said, Spark Therapeutics covering the tests currently. There's concern amongst our pharmacy and medical directors that that won't continue. And the testing, any genetic testing now is $1,000 or more. I mean, it's, it's, so when we talk about it's inconsequential, I, I tell you the medical and pharmacy directors do not look at genetic testing for anything, including this therapy, as inconsequential, because they're very concerned about over-testing. Okay. And just on that, I actually work with a lot of these labs, so I just looked up this, this one of the, the labs that I often use is Molecular Vision Lab. You can sequence RP65. This is just a commercial lab. It's $500 to sequence RP65, um, and it only sequences that gene. But I just, I would be curious, just, this is maybe something I shouldn't even ask, but what about the concept of neonatal screening? Is that something that is a terrible idea? But what, I mean, that would be asymptomatic minors and all children, but that would that would hit everybody, you'd get diagnoses for everyone. And I don't know, I mean, when I think about, I had a C-section, delivered my babies, healthily, twins, um, but you know, the costs that are happen around the time of a delivery, and I don't know what this, the genetic screening panel right now has for neonatal screening, but how much would an additional $500 add to that, and what do people think about? I bet somebody on CPAC knows the answer to that. <laughs> huge, yeah. Right. It would be huge. dollars times millions of babies. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. I, I, just there's not enough. I mean, the, re the, rationale, the, so small. the rationale for the newborn screening would be like, if we don't interact right now, the child's going to die. Like, yeah, you know, there's some right. metabolic disorder that if we don't pick it up in the next month, or, you know, hypothyroidism, which the problem with this is that there's nothing to do immediately, so they right. wouldn't want to attach it to newborn screening. And maybe if the cost were like $5, but yeah, it's $500. Maybe, right. Maybe in 10 years if the costs keep coming down. Right. Yeah. We'll, we'll Does that change point, if there is a genetic history in the family? That would be different. That's not... That's not, That's not screening. Screening, screening okay. would be everybody, but if there's a family history, then yes, the physician should be thinking about that, right. knowing that it's a genetic right. disorder. Yeah, I gotta say, $500 might be the cost of a lab, but it is double to triple that is what's billed to the insurer, and the insurer has to pay on contractual rates. So I, don't, I, just, I, have to be, I think we need to be careful about misperception of reality of costs. Just like the $850,000 for the Luxterna drug is the whack price, that is not the price that people will pay generally if there's a markup. It can be up to 2x on that. So we'll get, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll definitely get to that. So we, we, let's imagine we have an imaginary health plan colleague at the end of the table here. <clears throat> what would we advise or ask them about in terms of how they should be covering this test? I actually don't have any idea right now how often it's covered by health plans. Um, what, what the kind of criteria are for ordering the test. Does it have to be ordered by a specialist? I assume yes. But is there, does anybody know, and right now Spark is paying for this, is that correct? That's our understanding. So they're paying for it. At some point, they might say, we have a treatment, why are we yeah. being specially on the hook for this test? It should be the health insurance system that should pick this up. So let's assume that that's a trajectory that we're on. Is there anything we would say to the health plans, even from your guys' perspective, is there anything that you would advise which would be ideal for the way that health plans would make decisions around the coverage for this test? I guess on that, that's not our expertise. So right. I'm, I'm right. Don't come to that question. I guess it'd be more the clinical expert who's, who's ordering the test. So you've ordered this test a lot of times. 
Right. Um, and I often am ordering it in a, a panel, but right. um, but yeah, I mean, as far as who can order it, an ocular genetic. So you, there's a lot of ways to have it. Or, um, it either needs to be for most of these labs an ophthalmologist who's seen the patient, um, or actually, I think it, it could actually be a medical doctor. I think I've actually had pediatricians um, order this panel before, um, but also it could be an ocular genetic counselor. So I think that's a big other black box of people we haven't talked about. So there are a few. There's even telecounseling services. Informed DNA is one of them. Um, there are services where they have trained ocular genetic counselors that do all the logistics for physicians who don't feel like going through this time and logistic in their clinic. And um, they're often ordering the test, getting the pre-authorizations, billing the insurance first. I, I always use labs that, that, that bill the insurance first, get the pre-authorizations, and sort of take that legwork away from me. And a lot of the labs, commercial labs for genetic testing will do that. But there are only a few ocular genetic testing labs. This isn't like ordering a CBC where you get it done right, at Quest. Right, this is right. a very specific test that's done at a few mm -hmm. uh, excellent centers across the US. And we're shipping out, now that luckily they have saliva samples rather than blood samples that they take. And the processing takes four to six weeks. And then you get back a report that's usually this huge 20 page document of all of the phenotypes that they are, you know, the, the, the genotype. And, um, and you need, usually need to have some element of being able to offer the patient genetic counseling at the end of that. So not just your average Joe is going to want to order this. All right. So is it fair to say that we want the health plans to obviously uh, refocus on their policies and procedures for, for this test being approved. I can imagine what we don't want is some kind of uh, opaque process where a request goes in and it bounces back and the patient's gone or, or you know, something else where the system makes it hard to get the test for patients who have you know, credible clinical symptoms that suggest the, the condition. So right now I'm not sensing that you're finding a lot of barriers to getting the test paid for when you order it. But you may be special. I, 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 in general, we usually hear around genetic testing that there's a lot of variation in how they're covered in the different prior auth procedures for them. Right. So sorry we don't have a health plan person here to kind of inform us about how, how they do it. Um, so I'm, I'm going to get to the payment issues very quickly. But before we do, I just wanted to um, ask one question actually about, now let me, let me move to the provider markup issue, because that is um, something that Pat just raised. Now Spark, uh, I think to everybody uh, uh, has, has acknowledged to their credit, they started thinking about these issues long before, and part of their early announcement was that they were working with payers to figure out a way to direct contract with the, the payers and to come up with some kind of fee-based fee approach to paying providers but that was not a buy and bill kind of situation where they could market, market up. Um, company's not here to, to help explain exactly how that's going, but to the extent that that's part of your agreements or part of your reasoning, um, anything that you'd like to share about how that's going? Is it, you think it's gonna be easy to negotiate with the providers, uh, the, the centers that are gonna do this treatment? Well, you know the answer to that is no. You know the that. answer is no. <laughs> so tell, it's not easy. It's not easy. But, uh, I, you know, I, I think what I would add there is, uh, um, you know, it's public information that we're uh, working closely with Spark from an Express Script standpoint for some uh, alternate uh, distribution models and uh, different ways of delivery as, as, as part of an effort to uh, make this therapy more affordable and more accessible to patients. Uh, that doesn't make it any cheaper necessarily, it just makes it a little easier for, uh, our hope is a little easier for payers to uh, manage their spend, control their spend, and if that results in it being a little easier for patients to have access to the therapy and benefit from it, then fantastic, we all win. So, um, you know, I think what I would say at a high level is Express Scripts, we have a, we have a little bit of a non-traditional model in that we have the ability to uh, ship directly to a to a treatment center, we can ship with a patient label, we can clear under the pharmacy benefit, medical benefit, uh, we could sell to a hospital in a traditional uh, kind of buy and bill manner if you want. And what we see um, out of this, in our, in our experience is we have experience with a couple of other uh, gene therapies and gene-like therapies uh, that are high cost, they have uh, a lot of similarities to what we're dealing with here. Uh, we see payers, uh, because of the small, relatively small number of patients that we have, and which is kind of a luxury that we all have at this point in time, right? We know there's a lot of drugs in the pipeline. Uh, the challenges are only going to, you know, increase. But at least today, 
with very small patient populations, we see payers uh, basically uh, shopping their options, if you will, looking at, okay, if I go through the traditional, uh, you know, my traditional contracting method with this hospital, well, they, you know, basically we pay a percentage of charge and they mark everything up three or four times and, you know, that can be, you know, what that leads to is a, a no on the part of the payer, so that doesn't work very well. So what are the other alternatives? And that's, those are the alternatives of being able to ship, you know, directly to the treatment center, uh, manage the, uh, the accounts payable for them, uh, be able to ship with a patient label, make it available through the pharmacy benefit or medical benefit with a patient label on it. Having those options has been uh, very well received by the payer community. So I'm just curious, so um, now that this is available, Spark has been working obviously with centers of excellence. Now that becomes your relationship as well. So did Spark basically say, here are the 10 centers that we think can start to launch this treatment in the first six months. You need to now work out some kind of contract with them around how you're going to pay them for the treatment. That's not our, that's not our, you know, we're giving you the ability to do that contracting, but it's really kind of up to you. And does that mean that with each of those 10, you're going to have to strike a, a completely different bargain, if you will, you, you gave a kind of series of different options. Is it going to be really different for each one of these centers of excellence, or are you trying to come up with a template that they all do? Well, it, it's not a template, and it kind of goes back to the first question of, is it it's easy, and I know you were suggesting that it is, and no. of course it's not. Uh, it's really driven by, uh, it originates with the payer. Right, because with the payer, I mean, until a patient presents, this is all like a theoretical conversation, right? So, I mean, everyone has their opinions and their views on what should happen, but when you've got a patient, you've got a child that you want to have benefit from the therapy, that's where the rubber meets the road. And now all of a sudden, uh, we've, we're, we're in a mode of trying to figure out, well, how's this gonna get paid for? How do we get it cleared? And that just takes a lot of hand-holding that involves uh, the patient and the family, uh, as well as the payer, as well as the treatment center, as well as the physician. And it's really comes right down to, in its simplest form, is just working across all of those stakeholders to find a position that everyone can live with where uh, the patient can benefit from the therapy and it'll be paid for. So are you suggesting that it's literally a, an artisanal case-by-case -case approach? Or? It is, as unbelievable as that may sound, yes, that's where it is today. Do you think that's where it should be a year from now? Sure. Well, I, whether or it should it, or it shouldn't it, be, I think that may still it be may where it'll be, be a case. year. I, I guess I, I don't quite understand that. Um, the payer has a contract with a facility. Yes, look at each one. In this case, there are seven that Spark has authorized to perform the therapy. Um, so the payer has a contract with that facility as to how much they agree to pay for the service of the surgery and then the drug. So there's a contract. And in the case of the world I live in with the Blue Cross Blue Shield, um, there's an association that has some governance but not much. It's each blues plan contracting in the state, at the state level. So that's what we're trying to work through for seven facilities, that, doesn't, that clearly tells you that there's not one in every state. So um, trying to figure out how to, uh, with the association along with Sparks, I'll, I have to give a lot of kudos to Spark. Um, they have been in front of this, as you said, Steve, at the beginning here about helping and, being, and coming to the table with all entities, the facilities, the payers, and the patients to ensure that now that they have a drug approved, that the drug will be provided in a timely fashion at a reasonable rate. And we can avoid these current, because the current existing contracts on drugs and facilities, frankly, is the charge master, which can be, up, like I just said, up to two times markup. So that's what we're, the risk is. Right. And so we're trying to avoid that risk, because that is the contract. We could, we could just, a facility could just say, our contract is with you, two times markup for all drugs. So we're gonna mark this up two times 850,000. Now that doesn't seem like it, could ha it will happen, but it could. So how do we go back and renegotiate? It's not we, meaning the PBM. This is the blues plans, at least that's my world I live in. Um, well, so I'm just trying to, that, that's, if, if, to answer your question, that's mm -hmm. what's happening right now. We're, we're hoping that we have very little markup on WAC because WAC's $850,000. So, and uh, Pat, what you said I agree with and it's accurate, 
although I would say that it's it's a little more uh, limited than what it has to be because I mean as a P, even as a PBM I'm, a large number of our customers are health plans including a number of large number of blues plans right so so this is not we're not talking about two totally different universes here it's the same universe what Pat was describing is the conventional way of approaching contracting what we're really put, you know pushing on at Express Scripts is how innovative can we be within the existing confines of the healthcare reimbursement system that we have today. And so this is where the collaboration, you know, that we've had with Spark has been all around offering options for those payers. And they have more options than just the contract that they have with a, with the hospital, right, the existing one. Now, if one of those parties squares off and said, well, look, we're not going to be flexible and this is the only way we're going to, well, okay, they can take that position. But if there is a desire to make the treatment available to the patient right. who can benefit and to make it affordable, there's a lot that can be done if we approach it the right way. So from a patient's perspective, there are seven centers right now that are open for business? Well, that's what we're told. That's it, right? Okay. Well, I, maybe there'll be more in the, in the near future. But let's assume there are seven. Um, and you have to strike different agreements with each of them, um, some of which will look like a better financial deal for the payer. Is a patient from Florida going to have to go to the treatment center in North Dakota? Um, Spark is paying for travel costs, at least now. So is, is there any thought that the vari vari uh, variation in contracting will lead to incentives to try to get patients to some of those seven and not to the other seven? You don't want to answer that? <laughs> well, I think that's possible. I just say that that's not out of the realm of potentiality. Uh, the reality is there's, yes, just having so few centers of excellence mm -hmm. is naturally going to bring some of that. All right. Well, I can imagine a natural tension between patients and families hoping to stay as local as possible. Well, that's what we'd want to. Everybody, everybody would want that. And if the financial delta between the contracting of these different centers of excellence is enough, it may create some interesting situations, I guess. All right. By the way, if you guys have any specific comments or questions, uh, turn up your tent cards and I'll, I'll try to get to you. Um, in the short term with the seven, and I know we are talking about only a total in the country of one to 2,000. Those are the numbers that are usually thrown around. In the short term though, sometimes when there's a new paradigm shifting treatment, there are patients who have been waiting, right? They're kind of in the background warehouse sometimes is the term, but maybe that's not the case here. Are we going to face any kind of crunch in the short term of getting patients treated who are identified and want or, or need treatment now? Is there going to be, or do we have plenty of spots across the country to just send them all now? Or do we need to actually do a little bit of thinking about the ones we send first and other people, they get to wait a little bit? Any well, thought on that from the... I mean, I know every data. IRD specialist, and there aren't that many of us in the country, has a list of patients on their database ready to go and geared up. So I definitely have my own list. It's still short because these, this is a rare disease. Um, but those patients are... Um, you know, I, I mean, I don't know if there's going to be a, a rush. I mean, I, I still think those are small small numbers. Um, but, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think that... that I, have, I have three patients right now, I can tell you right now, that are ready to go the moment and they're relatively local to me too, that are ready to go the moment the therapy is available and working out things with their insurance companies and have already been pre-screened at a site. So this is happening right now. I mean, these patients are already going down to do their screening visits. Um, but that's a really important, I didn't really realize that, that their insurance company can say, well, actually, we don't want you to be treated. The site in Florida is Bascom Palmer. Um, so I didn't realize that they, they could say, well, sorry, we think that the other site, Pennsylvania or whatever, is going to be less expensive, so we really want you to go there. So then patients might be bounced around. I, I didn't realize there would be big discrepancies between the contracts with different we sites. Know. We don't know. It, just, yeah. it was a kind of... But yes, I mean, patients if. are already getting screened, and, um, and I, I have... So there might be a little surge in demand. Yeah, there'll probably be a small surge it, at the beginning. Clinicians hate to think this way. Everybody does. But if there are limited spots in the treatment centers early on, and there's more demand than there is supply, what would the clinical instinct be about how to prioritize which patients are sent first? Those with more preserved vision, those with the worst vision? How, well, or or what, what, would the, is, what, what, what would the basis, if any, be for deciding who goes first? I mean, I, I think that the holdup is going to be a policy insurance issue, not a site and a surgery issue. So I think the surgery takes 
an hour, and I mean, we, you can do that surgery tomorrow. You know, there's nothing you have to really prepare. So there's not an issue as far as the holdup or backlog as far as the logistics of the surgery and the delivery. And these surgeons are ready to go. We do seven or eight retina cases a day. You'd kind of have it scheduled, and you could add it on to your schedule for tomorrow. It's that kind of case. I think it's more of a logistics of when, when that, I mean, you said it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis. So when that patient's insurance is ready for them <laughs> to get the therapy, then they'll be the next one to go. So I think the reality is going to play out that just going to be whichever patients are ready to go from a right payer standpoint, but um, the, the, the case is very quick. Okay. Harold, you had a question or comment? Question. Uh, Harold, do you mind using the mic? Uh, question for, for Patrick and for Bill. So when we read this report, there's a, the cost effectiveness of the treatment varies quite a bit depending on the age of the person, their, their current visual status. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, this is an issue that involves children, it involves blindness, it, it's an incredibly uh, uh, sensitive arena for everyone concerned. Uh, how, is it, how do you think about uh, heterogeneous cost effectiveness across the patient population? And to what extent is it realistic, particularly when this is a rare condition that has this, these unique characteristics, for you to prioritize patients. You know, tell me a little bit about how you, how you think about that. Because there are clearly some patient groups where it doesn't look very cost effective by the traditional measures and others where it does. And, and I'm curious how that enters your thinking organizationally and what you can practically do given all the constraints that, that are going on. Do you want to start? Or you want oh, to? Uh, I, I look at this as a ripe opportunity for outcomes-based contracting. So if uh, the uh, the therapy, we'd like to see ideally not having to pay anything up front and waiting to see within 30 to 90 days if it's working. And then, I mean, we agree with the Sparks current proposed, I keep saying Sparks, I apologize, Spark uh, proposed uh, outcomes contract, which is 30 to 90 days assessment and then at a 30-month point would be great to have a further out point, but we understand. Um, so, uh, the, but right now we're asked to pay the entire amount up front with some potential return of that money at those points if the drug's no longer working. It would be, or I heard from Spark earlier, uh, the, the chief medical officer, some incremental payment, that would be even more potentially wonderful. We're very thrilled about that. That's the first time I've heard that, actually. So that would be nice, too. So I, 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 like, I, like I said earlier, Spark has been wonderful to work with. They've been in front of this uh, from the very beginning. We started talking with them many months ago. They came and talked with us and started preparing for the, getting our thoughts as how, this, how the system needs to change for these incredibly expensive therapies. So we're thankful for that. I'll just add one more point. I, I look at this cost in the context of, say, CAR-Ts, though. I try to put this in a bigger picture than just blindness. Um, and you look at the CAR-T therapy. Now, ICER's working on that report. It's not done yet. But you're talking about a therapy for children, once again, that comes in at 375000 and cures them of their cancer. So part of this and the value there. And we're now talking 850 for blindness, 850K. Um, and I, I just, you, you know, I think those things need to be thought about. I'm, I'm not saying I'm anything definitive here, but I'm just saying things need to be thought about in more in the context of the general healthcare system and what things are now costing us. Yeah, and I would, I guess I would add just kind of go back to your question of how do you, do we prioritize this or look at this? And I would say that one thing we're all very aware of is that the payer community as a whole is very concerned about cost of health care, right? You know, newsflash, right? We all know that. Uh, the, and the cost of drugs like Luxterna are, are very concerning to this community. However, we have a belief that fundamentally for uh, these therapies that work and provide such uh, benefit that payers want to be able to afford them. I just can't imagine that fundamentally that, that any payer wants to deny the benefit right. of, now there are all kinds of questions about is it priced appropriately or what's the durability and so forth, but putting those aside for a second, we fundamentally believe every payer wants to be able to say yes to the appropriate patient that could benefit from this. And, and so with that said, we 
uh, believe that the, our mission is to help our, our clients manage their cost so that the appropriate patients are treated and that we're doing the best we can to manage uh, the cost so that it can be uh, affordable and made available. Uh, Outcomes-based, payment over time, all the, those are just tools to manage cost. There are a number of those, but at the end of the day, it's about uh, being able to responsibly manage the cost as best we can to ensure access and affordability. So let me play a devil's advocate. I want to drill back down into both the installment payment and the outcomes-based approach that people have praised Spark for, and it's been a, a core part of thinking about how we might, as a health system, uh, do a better job of affording high ticket items up front in particular in a variety of ways. The devil's advocate says outcomes-based is a fig leaf. Um, you just park your initial price high enough and you give a little bit back. Um, it doesn't really address the true value or affordability issue. It looks like it does, but it, it just, depending on where you start, if you give a little bit back, it can be inconsequential in the long run. So how do you answer the devil's advocate that says, for, for one thing, you can see the data, pretty much everybody who improves by 30 to uh, 90 days is going to be there at 30 months. So there's not too much of a suggestion that people are going to fall off the wagon, if you will, that way. Um, how, how, how did you decide whether the amount that would come back to you in an outcomes-based approach is worth the effort? Is, is it, is it is it, is it a mechanism that we want to pilot and we know it's not going to have that much an impact on costs in the short hand, but it's good to do anyway? Or do you think this is a really a core piece of today with Spark and this drug getting a good value? I, I would say that in general, we believe that this is the right direction, whether it's you know, a particular arrangement or contract is good or bad, that's, a, you know, that's almost a case by case discussion. We do believe that uh, that is the responsible approach to managing costs is to the degree we can have uh, these uh, guarantees and outcomes measures in place. So if they'd said we'll charge you 600,000 and no outcomes based or 850 and outcomes based, how do you decide which to do? Yeah, I don't think, I mean, we've never heard the question posed that way. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and, and I guess that goes back to whether you fundamentally believe the manufacturer is is increasing the price just so they could do a outcomes-based contract. Okay. I don't, I, I've yet to hear a manufacturer say that they were doing that. So if you pass up on the outcomes-based contract, is the price going to be lower? Well, I, that would bring a different consideration. Right. Well, I'd be surprised, obviously, if they and their business modeling don't look at different <coughs> options for a launch price and outcomes-based give right. back and how those compare in different ways. Pat, anything you'd like to I add? think it's more pilot, to your point. Uh, currently. Uh, I think it's great we're, we're working toward that. Um, we're hampered by a thing called best price and we right. don't need to go into that, but that is a legal uh, situation of pricing that the government forces that uh, makes it hard to do outcomes-based contracting that have serious dollars behind them. Mm -hmm. And Steve. Did, oh, sorry. Just, Brian, sorry. Yes. just that that uh, model has been used in other countries, and Australia and New Zealand are paying for CF drugs, cystic fibrosis drugs that are three, four hundred thousand dollars based on uh, outcomes. So they're saying your FEV1 breathing test has to go up by a certain amount or we're not paying. That's the government making mm -hmm. that decision. So it's been done. It's not like oh, yeah. it hasn't been done. It hasn't done here yet, though. So no. we're, 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 we're going to figure it out here. So the installment payments is another piece of the well, toolbox. It, oh, I'm it sorry, hasn't go ahead. Been, it hasn't been done with a money back, full money back guarantee. There have been right. rebates. I mean, like there that. there are a number of categories where uh, there are programs that offer a partial payment, which is, and again, we're working with the confines of our existing system. Right. But I, it's a fairly well established, I think, uh, and growing. More way, and more payers of, do have that kind right. of agreement now. So the installment payment is much less uh, <coughs> common. Um, and now that we're getting these one-time treatments with relatively high price, a lot of interest has been gone and has been focused, as our own policy summit did a couple of years ago. Do you th have you do you think there's any lessons? Or is it too early right now to learn where we're headed with installment payments for this drug? Any lessons learned yet about the thinking you've done about it, and whether it seemed like it's just not going to work, or whether you think there are real opportunities for it here? What do you think? This is the first time I've heard that there that there's interest in installment. So I guess I haven't had a chance to. Process. Well, maybe maybe Bill, you. So I uh, believe that uh, there is a real opportunity here for for payment over time 
uh, programs, we'll call them, just speaking in, in general terms. And, and here's why that opportunity exists. One of the, it's small patient population, major dollars involved, right? One of the biggest considerations here or problems that, a, a, that your average health plan or small employer has is what we sometimes hear referred to as lightning strikes, right? Okay, so lightning strikes, a patient shows up and like, bam, there's a million dollar cost we weren't expecting. How do we afford that? Well, you know, a plan sponsor who's thinking about this has really one of cho two choices here. Do they build that into their premiums, premiums up front, thinking that, okay, if there's a thousand patients in the U.S., I mean, the odds of any, you know, just go pick a health plan or an employer, they probably won't have any patients that might have this therapy, or they might have one, right? Well, so should they build in the assumption they're going to have five patients on a million dollar therapy into their premiums and charge all their members? Well, they don't really want to do that. So we feel like that this uh, immediate, like, budgetary, you know, shock that happens could be lessened by uh, enabling a payment over time. It doesn't make the therapy less expensive, uh, you know, in total, but it does enable a budgeting process uh, to, to take place, and it's a little friendlier for, uh, for plants being able to uh, afford the therapy. So if that works the way that we mm -hmm. believe it will, that will, again, improve access and affordability, make it easier for uh, plant sponsors who want to uh, cover the therapy be able to cover the therapy. There is a limitation on how that is done today from a manufacturer standpoint, because the manufacturers, you know, with best price reporting, it's their initial price charged is their best price, right? So to have a 50% down is a 50%, you know, best price. So that is a, that's a challenge for manufacturers. But uh, for, uh, for some payers, plan sponsors, there's the ability to uh, be able to field those type programs. So are you, who, who has the responsibility or the power to create those? Obviously the company has to be involved, but because in our previous discussions around this issue, it might be the company has to go find a third party who can, it can, or who, who, can it could, who can basically then pay the company up front so that, as you said, the best price problem doesn't kick in, but the ultimate payer can pay in installments to that third party. Yeah. Is that the model that you're, it, that you're working on with, it, with What them, we're working or? on now is a contract between ourselves and our plan sponsors, right. which will be employers or health plans. So who's going to float the money, basically? Uh, it would be uh, Express Scripts. Interesting. And you think that's, that's going to be a model that you anticipate more frequent uh, use of in the future? Uh, we'll have to see, but we believe so. We believe, that, uh, we believe that it will be very helpful to many of plan sponsors. All right, thanks. Actually, one quick question about um, patient responsibility for some of the, the charges here. Um, obviously, super high expense. It would eat up your deductible and everything else in one fell swoop. Is that what's going to happen, basically, for a patient who needs this? You just charge the max of the deductible, and then it's a one-time treatment for which you would pay a co-insurance? I can't imagine. A co-pay? How, how's the patient out of pocket going to be managed for a treatment like this? So in my Monday conversation with Spark Therapeutics, our understanding is that the um, member share is going to be covered through the deductible by Spark. Can you say that again? So whatever so Spark, the patient... Well, Spark via their patient cover the assistant deductible. program for the vast majority of patients, and I don't have exact details on who would be excluded, and I got the impression that it wasn't... The means test was quite generous on the income basis, that they would be paying for the cost shares through the deductible. Through the deductible. And then past the deductible, it's the patient's responsibility to the out-of-pocket max. Mm -hmm. I think once you're through the deductible, you're Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. You're but good. there's still, but once you're through the deductible, then you kick in and you would pay what? <coughs> Copay? Copay. <coughs> minimal amount. Okay. Is that what, is that common across what payers are setting up at this point, you think? Yeah. Okay. So the principle is we don't want this one treatment to cripple families. Or to uh, stop the therapy. Or to stop them from getting it. Right. Okay, good. All right. Um, so let's a talk about. Question over here. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Rachel. I wanted to follow up on the the mortgage or installment yes. payment yes. question or whatever we're calling it. Let's put best price to one side because I think the current assumption is CMS is going to have to get involved to waive it somehow for us to go forward with that. But I am wondering what sort of time frame that payers or PBMs are imagining for that 
repayment to take place because there's so much churn. So, so Bill, when you talk to your payers right, what, or your plan sponsors, what's the amount of time that patients are spending? Because unless we're imagining the installment payments traveling with them to their next insurer, which I think most of us are not imagining that, and to attach it to the patient would be worse, um, then it's got to be their responsibility. So what kind of time frame are we talking about? It's well, I'll stop short of giving any like specific numbers, but don't think of it like a like a thirty year mortgage. It's not it's a right. it's a pretty short term, but again it 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 just helps soften the immediate year impact. Let's say that. And what, and what you started to touch on, I think, is another like, whole fascinating topic of this portability, right? And and portability is just to kind of sum that up. And you touched on a lot of these items. Is well, it's a great idea if you're a uh, health plan that's a giver, right? Meaning you have a patient that that leaves when and they and you still got half the stuff that's due. If you're a receiver, meaning you've got a patient that now comes under your coverage and half of their treatment cost is still, you know, is is still out there and has to be paid for, well, it's not so good. So, uh, are we there yet in terms of being able to offer portability? No, that's a bit of the holy grail. I think it's something that's definitely on our radar. We're working on. It's just it's going to take a while before we can get there. Yeah. So I have two questions about price for you guys, and then we'll start to kind of circle back for some final uh, guidance from the rest of the panel, too. So um, one question is about the old kind of, the old saw that high prices for ultra-rare disease treatments are okay by payers, because if you multiply the small patient numbers even by a high price, it's, an, it's, a, it's a budget impact that can be swallowed, if you will, managed through the uh, actuarial process in a way that doesn't crush us, if you will, crush the system. How do you think, how do you think payers think of where the threshold is when that deal no longer applies? So let's assume that this was a, a gene therapy for uh, a, a patient population of 10 times this size or 20 times this size. How and when do you think that your own systems start to say, now we've got a problem or now we've got to do something else different um, 850,000 with some outcomes-based payback for 1,000 to 2,000 patients across the country, okay, but how, how do you think that works within both individual payers and then across the whole system? Assuming that we are going to get some gene therapies for bigger patient populations, hemophilia, sickle cell, um, other things like that. What do you think is the I'll future? Just see, of I'll this? just say in general that yeah. as you were referencing at one point in time there was a view that okay well the cost of ultra orphan or our very small small patient population therapies was not much of a concern because yeah, there were just so few patients. Well I think generally speaking that time has passed that payers basically just accept that and don't worry about it too much. It's The problem is there's so many of those therapies now and there's so many more in the pipeline that every one of these is a concern. Uh, but if your question is like, where do we hit tilt? I, I have no idea. Okay, Pat, do you have anything? Uh, I'm concerned now. <laughs> um, you know, we forecasted on 15 million commercially insured lives that we have. That's health insurance marketplace, self-insured, and fully insured business. That we get 31. Well, we just found out a week or so ago that we have two, two kids in the same family, so we're already uh, good almost in double digit percent on the way there. Uh, and that, that's in, that actually hit one self-insured employer. So that self-insured employer, um, our average size of self-insured employer, uh, employees and dependents about 2,000 people. They then have about 10 million in all their healthcare costs paid for through all their premiums in an annual year. They're now gonna have 1.7 million if the drug is paid for at WAC in new cost in that year, thank goodness they have reinsurance because if they didn't, that may be the difference between that business making it or not in that year. And their premiums are definitely going to go up next year on top of that. But somebody still has to pay for it all. And I think that's the hard part here is that this is just one gene therapy. We, as you started off today, that we anticipate many more to come, and it's, it's frankly not sustainable to price them at the same rate. All right. One of the things that your, your story pointed out to me earlier was the idea that uh, self, self insured employers, they can be big or small, relatively small. And 
if they, as you said, if they don't have reinsurance and something like this pops up, it could be crippling to their, to their company. They might have to drop health insurance entirely or whatever it might be. So one policy recommendation is that in a new era of these kinds of treatments, self-insured employers should think very carefully about their reinsurance and about other mechanisms for managing um, kind of sudden high costs like yeah, this. Yeah, and another quick point on right. that, Steve. But they cap it. Yeah. Um, reinsurance companies have done something called lasering out hemophilia, saying they don't even count. So I want to make sure. It. Can you all hear in the back? I just want to. Hemoph no, nope. uh, I think I have to pull Reinsurance companies have done something with hemophilia is that they laser it out. They won't even cover it. It doesn't count toward reinsurance. You could, I could see where reinsurance companies decide to laser out gene therapy. I'm, I'm, I don't want them to, but th that's the kind of, and also say that what that goes to is another thing that just, you know, somewhat blows my mind as a health researcher, health economist at Prime, I've been asked to model out not covering specialty drugs for self-insurers. What it would, would it mean if I, if we as a self-insured company chooses to not cover the special drugs, you know, the autoimmune drugs, the rheumatoid right? So right, cystic fibrosis drugs. They want me to model that out as to what harm would happen, and I refuse to do that. I'm not going to. But that's the. Those are the kind of questions that we're receiving from self-insured employers now, because of the affordability problem we have. Yeah. So last question about pricing, and it's, this is more of kind of a futuristic question too, in a way. Um, so as we were doing the value, you know, the cost effectiveness analyses and thinking about how the price lined up with downstream benefits, we had not a lot of healthcare system costs that were being offset by this treatment, right? All the cost offsets were happening pretty much outside the healthcare system. So we're now trotting towards, again, a, a good future where there will be one-time treatments for things like hemophilia or, or sickle cell or cystic, or cystic fibrosis, for which there are extensive downstream health system costs. So do you think the price and the value of those treatments should reflect how much is offset downstream to the extent that if we were able to cure hemophilia for a 50-year lifespan, um, there would be many patients for whom you could wrap up all those downstream cost savings and say that the drug is cost effective at $25 million per treatment. <laughs> so that number kind of makes people chuckle sometimes, but it, it poses some real hard questions about the incentives that we want to set for innovators. Where do we want them to try to come up with these one-time treatments? Do we not want them to go after high expense areas? Of course we do, but then what does that mean for the, for the ultimate costs of our healthcare system if we basically absorb those cost savings and put it into the pricing of the new treatment? Any, any general reaction to, to the future of pricing as it lines up with the downstream health care cost offsets? How do you think the payer community will respond to those kinds of treatments? Okay, I'll say, I'll say I think with hemophilia treatment, just using that as an example, I mean, when, a, when the reality is a hemophilia a patient can be a million dollar a year spend, uh, it's going to be easier to justify the cost offset but there is a point at which that becomes ridiculous, too. And, and so in the absence of talking about a specific price for the gene therapy, you can't really say whether it's worth it or not. But let's just say it's just easier to get your head around uh, the cost offset of, of a one-time treatment that cures hemophilia. Okay. Yeah, Pat? I, I'll second that. And it, I, the societal costs are important. It, it does become harder from the justification of, of hard dollars. Great. All right, I'd like to uh, conclude the policy roundtable portion of our program by letting each of you in one sentence stating the one thing that you think is the most important action that somebody should take coming out of this meeting to do the best thing we can for patients and the health system. So what's, the, we've talked about a lot of different things that should happen or could happen. Um, if you had to try to crystallize it into one action, by a specific group, stakeholder, organization, um, what would it be to try to push things forward in the right direction? Now I'm going to make it hard because I'm going to have to pick somebody to go first. I'll just I'll go down the line from from Janet. 
I guess the one thing that I would want uh, to have taken into consideration is establishing, if you will, whether, if you will, a process by which you're looking both at cost, at cost as well as looking at uh, the policies and the processes that are going to be used to make these decision makers regard decisions, regardless of who's uh, making the decision. And, and I say that and frame that in that way because I think that without making sure that the appropriate um, partners are at the table, but also at the nucleus of the family that we, we would risk losing, I think the overall benefit uh, to the individual families that are being served so that the, all, the right partners have to be at the table and the policies have to, to really be taken into consideration for how it, the drug therapy will be paid for and a, a clear decision on what the expected outcomes are and how we're going to measure those outcomes have to be taken into consideration. Great. Thank you very much. Caitlin, what do you think? I guess mine is from a patient perspective that I think based on this meeting, I feel as though we need to work on being able to get out to the patient community, identifying patients through some form of screening, and that for those patients to have the ability to make the choice to get this treatment. And I, I can't speak to the insurance or the cost part of it, but it should be, they should be able to make their own choice. Thank you very much. Um, from a clinical trial person's perspective, I think we've learned a lot today that we are still making a lot of assumptions because of these models, and I think a lot of it is because as a retinal community and a low vision community, we really are just starting to create, understand the concept of um, visual function measures for low vision patients, and I think that that's going to be really important moving into other gene therapy or other treatment trials for low vision retinal diseases is we do need to really start to validate the measures like the modified VF25 and validate the um, MLMT and these low vision and be able to uh, low vision measures. So visual function outcome measures and understanding them, validating them, and being able to uh, communicate that information to the FDA and right. agencies is very important. And I'll add, because I can't help but say, and link that to established uh, quality of life yes, measures yeah. so that we can crosswalk, uh, exactly. which was much of the challenge here. Bill, uh, one, one sentence. Who needs to do what? Just real quickly, I'll say that we're fortunate to live in an age where we have so many uh, truly life-changing uh, innovations and therapies that are coming along. Uh, that brings with it the challenge of affordability. Uh, the only answer that, uh, I, that I think we have for affordability is collaboration across the stakeholders and thinking, out, thinking outside of our just normal conventions. Thank you. Pat? CMS needs to change best price. <laughs> because dot, dot, dot. Uh, because we can't do outcomes-based contracts to negotiate the payment to a value price that may be lower than what the set price is. Great. Thank you very much. All right. We will get a chance to uh, formally thank you uh, with a round of applause later, but I'll do it now, too. How's that? <laughs> thank you for our applause here on the table. Um, you, if you need to go to the airport or something, please do. If you can, we're just going to now have final, very brief concluding statements by the CPAC members themselves. And we'll start with Harold and work our way back around to the chair. So if you'd like to, again, in one sentence, state your key takeaway, a theme that you'd like the final report to make sure that it captures, um, please do. This is really difficult because it's high cost, but it's more fun to be discussing a, an important clinical breakthrough that's expensive than to discuss many of the other controversies that we face. Thanks. Paul. Yeah, I think, well, I, in the past I've been um, ambivalent about these outcome-based contracts. I think this is one setting where given the very high uncertainty of benefit that they could be very useful. Okay, thanks. Brian. Um, one sentence is hard. This is, you know, I would agree with, uh, I think it was Bill who said this is a wonderful time to be debating these issues. I do think we have to really think seriously about how we're going to deal with gene therapy when it becomes more common because it's not sustainable at the current price. Okay. I, I think I'm just going to reiterate what's been said before. It's, uh, I mean, this is a novel breakthrough. It's, it's good. Um, and it's, it should be 
it should be worth something, and I don't think anyone's disputing that, but trying to find new ways, whether it's outcomes-based payment or something else to do that, especially since we're tying it to how long it's going to last, uh, seems like a good idea. Thank you. Shume. Yeah. <clears throat> I just want to share uh, my youngest brother actually had the condition, so um, how much I wish we had this treatment when he was young. So thank you for including me in this discussion. Thank you. Claudia? Yep. I, I'll say that uh, with gene therapy, especially something like this that we talked about today, how important it's going to be to, for us to look at benchmarking these contextual and other considerations. And I just want to highlight some of the conversation we had today about the life stage matters and when, uh, if this, if we can help people at a point in their life when they're building human capital, social capital to climb out of their socioeconomic status and have a better life for themselves and their loved ones, that has to be worth something and we need to find a way to make it a metrics that we can look at across different therapies. Great, right, thank you. Rob. Yeah, I'd like to see, Steve, if we can really highlight one of these, the, the major issue that you touched on in pricing, which is the fact that this is a type of therapy where when we look at the impact on, on payers, private payers, employers, we're privatizing costs that are where the benefits are largely socialized right. because the poverty rate, issues on education, public accommodation. So this is really pushing tons of costs into the private sector where the benefits are largely in the public sector. And there's just got to be implications around that for as these therapies proliferate. Okay, thank you very much. Rachel. Yeah, I agree with, with what's been said. I just want to thank um, Caitlin and Janet for helping us, I think, understand the perspective of what it's like to, to receive this treatment, to uh, live in the community, work with the community who's affected by this, because so much of what we talked about is, is contextualizing this for the community and trying to make sure that people will more broadly have access and education. So thank you. Awesome. So we're asked at all these meetings to deliberate on cost and benefit, and just because we do consider cost, uh, which is our charge, does not mean we are overlooking the immense benefit of the of the therapy. All right. Thank you. Who's next? Reem. Um, Steve, I would like to to thank ICER, especially this time for taking on this um, an ultra rare condition and the first gene therapy. So a very exciting time for for all of us. But I want to highlight we are at a paradigm shift, where, and we really need to be very um, conscious and innovative uh, about having um, creative discussions about pricing and about models of payment to continue this hope. You know, this meeting brings hope, but I don't want to feel that the hope is being, you know, killed because we, and it's maybe not for the specific condition, but looking at gene therapy in general. Thank you. All right, thank you. Ed. I'm just reflecting on a little bit of history. 10 to 20 years ago, we used to have in the pharmacoeconomics classes, uh, this would have been a thought exercise, and, and now it's real. Uh, I'd also like to thank ICER for trying out the, uh, the CPAC with guests as a grateful guest. We're, we're th the Midwest is, is happy to have uh, all these wonderful folks from the East and West Coast. So. Um, I've been so inspired, I think, today by the scientific innovation from Spark. I mean, it's bold, and it's a privilege to get to talk about, about that. I think inspired by Janet and, and Caitlin. I think for adding, for me, for adding color to this very difficult issue of how do you measure the utility of vision loss, because it's probably not a linear relationship. And I think, Caitlin, you definitely described that there's inflection points where it seems to really, really matter and why this therapy is important there. And obviously for, to, to the ICER team and, and the panelists today for some incredibly thoughtful analysis that was very difficult. It was a heavy lift to do this. And I think the respectful dialogue we had today, um, you know, I really appreciate uh, people sharing quite openly and candidly their, their perspectives and opinions. And, and I think this is the way a, a community of scholars and, and thinkers and community of uh, of patients should be working together. So it's a privilege to work for you all today. Thank you very much, Eric, and thanks for your chairmanship today. So just very briefly, um, I again would like to really salute uh, the people who came from far away uh, for the policy roundtable. Um, we often, or almost always, really feel how 
central the contributions are of the clinical experts and, the, and representatives from the patient community. And today was just a, a case in, in great point. I remember starting today's uh, intro by saying it was a scientific milestone. I think it's clear it's a milestone in the life of patients and their families too that is part of the celebration of what's going on. But I would also like to celebrate that in a, in a country in which it's often very hard to have discussions about fundamental issues, that's what you guys did today. We talked about an expensive treatment for an ultra rare condition with lots of uncertainty around the different elements of the outcomes and the long term findings, the costs inside the healthcare system, outside. These are, in a sense, the, 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 you know, kind of the, an example of what would have been a thought experiment for an ethics class, or a health economics class, or a, you know, a social kind of discourse class. And we've managed to bring it together today and to try to wrestle with these in a public hearing in a way that hopefully can provide some, some light into these issues, both now but also for future, uh, for future topics. So as a precedent for high science, high-minded civil discourse with the input of all the stakeholders, I just have to salute the, the CPAC for your role in helping make that happen. So thank you again to our policy roundtable, thanks to the CPAC. We'll put out a final report in about two or three weeks that will have all of the voting incorporated as well as the best we can do at uh, kind of catching some of the key commentary and some policy recommendations related to many of the things that came up today. But obviously the story doesn't stop here for this treatment or for the ones that are in the pipeline, and we'll be back to revisit some of these uh, issues uh, in the near future. Thanks again to those who participated in the audience and to those um, on the webcast, and um, safe travels home, everybody. Thank you.